Okay, so hi, I'm Jim Downing. I work in the chemistry department at the University of Cambridge. Um, I'm going to talk to you a little bit about a programming language called Clojure. Um, Clojure is a, a functional lisp, to put it in its uh, classification of programming languages. I actually got interesting, interested in it because of the, the functional aspects. Because um, I've got a, well, I'm, I'm betting that functional languages are going to be a big thing in the next few years as uh, we get more cores in our computer rather than uh, bigger clock speeds. Um, if you read Tim Bray's blog, you'll find the full kind of e expansion of that argument. Basically, functional languages don't give you enough rope to hang yourself when you're doing multi threaded programming. But basically, when you've got a multi threaded application, if you've got shared state, if you've got mutable shared state, and a lot of threads needing to access it. You have to be very careful about which threads are allowed to access what at what times. And in object-oriented languages, like for example in Java, you have these locks and you have synchronized blocks and all this kind of stuff. And you still have to be. That's a lot of help compared to you know what might be. And that you still that's still easy to get yourself into real problems and deadlock and and well and write suboptimal code. Um, in a pure functional language, the only thing a function can return is, is, a, is a function of its arguments. There are no side effects, there's no mutable state. Um, so there's, you don't have anything to trip yourself up. You, you know, you can, if you have a, a function you need to do over a list, since each function can only return its a function of its arguments, you can just do all of the functions at once in parallel, and every, every, all of those problems become embarrassing in parallel. So um, you end up a lot in functional, uh, in functional programming doing pairs of map reduce operations. So with map you apply a function to each of the members of a collection and give back the result of the function as a new collection. Um, and that's, that's parallelizable across as, you know, as far as you want. Um, and then you'll reduce where basically you accumulate up across the, the uh, list and that's not, that's not parallelizable at all. But the point is that you've, you've separated out the parallelizable bits of your program from the not parallelizable bits of your program rather than thinking about mutable state. The important thing is in the next couple of years you should probably uh, at least have a passing acquaintance with a functional language. And as soon as I saw that there was a functional language that worked on the JVM and we could call into all of our existing Java libraries, you know we've got something like about half a million lines of code of chemistry specific Java. Um, that's a fair legacy to leave behind or to try and recreate. So uh, access to that is pretty pretty valuable, um, and it, it, it's also a lot better for deployment. You know, you, there are plenty of places where if you want to deploy a web application, you stick it in your wire and you deploy it, and it's done. And we can do that with Clojure. In, in this case, we're using it for doing Sparkle queries against uh, the uh, government data and uh, processing those, uh, doing some stats over those. Okay, so the the basic idea was to. Um, is, is, was I kind of worked from the end of the problem. What I wanted to do was I wanted to find some embarrassingly parallel problems so we could play around with some uh, with some of this multi-core programming and work out how much faster we could make it and how easy it could be in in uh, enclosure. Um, so I thought about some problem where we could do a decent amount of work, computational work, to get the you know process of warm, um, and thought about correlating large data sets. Basically, a big data mining problem. And then I thought, well, what would be an appropriate data set to use? And it seemed obvious to use uh, data.gov.uk. Um, as we've dig you know, uh, we've, we've been digging further into it, and um, it, it's still early days for data.gov.uk. It's the, you know, the, the ontologies haven't been worked out, the, the different data sets haven't been encoded to the same scheme as just yet. So it's been more work than I necessarily you know, anticipated to even get the data sets for correlation out of it. Um, that said, we saw some good presentations earlier in the week and it seems to be going in a great direction. Um, one thing I've definitely learned from this is that uh, linked data is a lot better than Sparkle, that you, you make a lot better progress understanding what's out there, what data's out there and what predicates you can use if you can just use curl on the command line and get a description of what it is rather than having to craft Sparkle queries. I'm, I'm a little sceptical about this idea of everybody exposing their Sparkle endpoints. I think that probably linked data, just exposing linked data is a much more important thing than exposing Sparkle endpoints. For them.